everyone. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Sorry for the delay. No worries. Thank, thank you so much for coming. I'm Lila. This is Pat. We are so thrilled to have you on. Likewise. And this is Willie. He'll he'll be peeking in. And, and oh, Willie. Wait a minute. Look at that comment right there. They We were already warned about your cat. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. My, my cat is very camera friendly. So that's very, very sweet. Yeah. Um, a lot of opinions. So yeah. Lots of opinions. Yeah. So stand Good. by. <laughs> <laughs> we can't wait to hear them. Um, so we were planning on showing your campaign video before we introduced you, but I don't, you know, it's, it's, Three minutes. I don't know if you feel like is that all right if we, oh, if we sure. to do that. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. so yeah. great and it kind of puts it all out there. It does, yeah. After okay, that, don't need to say very much. Yeah, ah, stop <laughs> it. No, but it's just wonderful. It's a great introduction, and then we can just kind of delve into everything. Sounds great. Thanks. Sounds good. Okay, all right. Here we go. So we are so thrilled to have Dr. Stein here, and uh, this is her campaign video. Here we go. People are tired of being thrown under the bus by wealthy elites and their bought politicians. Tired of living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to pay the rent, locked in student debt and medical debt, child poverty doubling, rising diseases of despair, growing hopelessness. The political system is broken. The two Wall Street parties are bought and paid for. Over 60% of us now say the bipartisan establishments failed us, and we need a party that serves the people. I'm Jill Stein, and I'm running for president to offer that choice for the people outside of the failed two-party system. We'll put solutions to the crises we face, crushing inequality, endless war, and climate collapse, and we'll put these front and center in this election and on the ballot across the country. The ruling parties that got us into this mess aren't getting us out. Both parties are squandering trillions on the endless war machine, fueling conflict around the world, while tens of millions here at home lack food, housing, health care. Democrats have betrayed their promises for working people youth and the climate again and again, while Republicans don't even make such promises in the first place. And both parties are a danger to our democracy, expanding censorship, criminalizing protest, throwing competitors off the ballot, suppressing debates, American people who have been systematically locked out of these debates, rigging their primaries, so forget the pundits and the attack dogs who tell you to ignore your misery and just keep voting for those who caused it in the first place. Change won't come from the ruling elites. It comes from we the people. And when we stand together, we can create living wage jobs for all Americans. We can guarantee an economic bill of rights with the right to a job, to health care, to housing, to food, education, and more. We can abolish student debt, medical debt. We can create a Green New Deal with millions of jobs to fight climate collapse and protect Mother Earth. And we can ensure our constitutional rights and freedoms and justice for all. We can end the endless wars and rampant militarism and use diplomacy and international law instead to end violence, occupation, and apartheid. We do have the power, and we can use it in this election to start building an America and a world that works for all of us. Go to JillStein2024.com and join us. That's wonderful. It's so inspiring and uh, gives me hope, which is one of the few few places of hope I think any of us have anymore. Um, so first of all, thank you for running again. Thank um, you. We're a team here, you know. Yeah. What can we do? <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure you're seeing the comments. I mean, people are 
so excited and thrilled by you and everyone wants to exit the duopoly in our audience. My first question, because I agree with your whole platform, I adore you. One of my biggest uh, regrets is that in 2016, after working really hard for Bernie, I stupidly swallowed the Kool-Aid and cast my last vote for a Democrat for uh, Hillary. And then, you know, got yelled at and blamed anyway for the next seven years. <laughs> That's why um, I was a smart one. You had my vote. So, all right. Uh, no, I'm there. so embarrassed to even <laughs> admit that. It took me that long. But my question is, you know, for the people who continue to lob these bad faith arguments, either like, you know, there's only you know, the politics explainers. Uh, it's either going to be Trump or Biden. So, you know, why would you waste a vote? I hate that. But that's one of the things. Or, you know, even if you were elected, how would you get all this done? How are you going to pay for it? You know, all those sorts of things. How do you engage with that? level of ignorance and it feels willful at this point. Yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes the right thing is to just move on and to talk to people who are not locked in and right. who, um, you know, like there's a saying, I forget the author, uh, you know, a famous socialist author made the, uh, a novelist made the comment that, um, it's hard to convince a man of something when he's paid, you know, not to understand it. Right. And in my experience, especially it's economic elites, it's people who are comfortable where they are, or they have a special job in the Democratic Party universe, right. network, et cetera. And so they're not going to move, but it's, you know, there are so many people who are ready to go, you know, it's like, yeah. According to the polls, there are twice as many who now identify as independent as either Democrat or Republican. The numbers who are screaming for, you know, give me an alternative, that's like 63%. It's at a record high. You have now, you know, you have the, the Muslim Americans really leading the charge and breaking away with an incredible moral vision and a moral imperative. You know, how do people not hear that? I don't know. You have... Um, you know, you have uh, a thousand uh, black ministers who are saying, you know, we need to really seriously think about right. this too, uh, abandoning Biden. So, you know, the uh, the rebellion is out there and it's in full swing. And, you know, it's kind of a question of what's our strategy politically. You don't want to waste your breath talking to people right. who are already where you are or to people who you're never going to move. Uh, that said, there are a lot of people who will move and, and it's worth going through the litany, and I usually do go through the litany before I throw in the towel. <laughs> and, you know, we have a number of videos on this as well. Yeah. That, you know, I strongly recommend they're on our social media pages. Um, but, you know, for what it's worth, there are a number of arguments like that no one owns your vote. And any right. candidate who tries to uh, talk you into that they're entitled to your vote they don't deserve consideration. You know, yeah. they have they have really eliminated themselves, as far as I'm concerned, from being realistic uh, considerations to start with. So reminding people that no one owns their vote, it's like, right. really, do we have to do that? But some people are just so conditioned, they're so propagandized, they're so beaten down. Yeah. They, it's like being in an abusive relationship, yes. you know, and, and it's like having the courage to break up and walk away from a relationship that's hopeless and that is destroying you. Sometimes it's just a matter of, of reminding people how they're being needlessly destroyed. Um, you know, the fear mongering is a big part of it. And yeah. the uh, Trump derangement syndrome is a big part of it. I think the genocide helps break through that because there's hardly more, um, you know, compelling symbol of fascism right. than, uh, than genocide, than, um, you know, censorship, uh, right. than immigrant uh, bashing and xenophobia, which, you know, Biden said it in his, you know, Absolutely. Uh, his uh, State of the Union speech, and he's adopting the policies, he wants to build a wall, you know, so all, it's like the politics of fear has brought us everything we were afraid of, all the reasons yeah. you were told you had to vote for a Democrat, because you didn't want, you know, 
people tearing down Medicare and right. you know, destroying our right to health and just the whole nine yards across the board, nuclear weapons and their proliferation, you know, the savage attack on the climate. If you actually look at what Biden is doing, not what he's worse <laughs> And Trump. I mean, you don't get worse than 22 liquid natural gas export facilities, which the Sierra Club has documented. This is like kicking us back to 2005 levels of right. CO2 emissions. This like yeah. undoes all our progress. I haven't heard of anything that Trump is doing or proposes that comes anywhere near that. That is right. probably the single most destructive act to the climate that one can imagine. And when you hook that up with, with Biden's sabotage of the uh, uh, Nord Stream pipeline, which created the market, then, you know, so there are all those high fives, you know, yeah. work, you know, now we have a whole new market. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're producing now lots of methane for that market. After they spilled the biggest methane spill ever in history, it was either Biden or it was somebody that Biden gave the thumbs up to. But there's no. We'll doubt. never know because we're not investigating anymore. But there is, which is, which is the most incriminating thing of all. Of course, are, yeah, disgusting. That, that there kind is of no real where it's coming from. There's no real opposition to the Republican Party. Is why I see the Greens is so important because the Democrats. You know, now they're celebrating that they tried to give Republicans everything they wanted on immigration and they wouldn't take it. Like, that's a victory that we we like a fascist so order bill that we, <laughs> yeah. we gave them everything they wanted. And uh, yeah, and so my question to you is, I, I think a lot of people that you can reach are leery because they think you can't win. So let's just say you can't win. Like, hypothetically, I won't say that out loud. I apologize. Take okay. that back. <laughs> um, He's about but, to get fired from the show. Yeah, I'm canceled. But can you express the value of running as an opposition candidate, even if you weren't to win the, the value that your candidacy brings to the table? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's it's like a no brainer. Usually if you're going to walk a mile, you start by walking 10 feet first, you know, and so you have to come up in the polls. Your numbers have to come up. And if there is no lesser evil. If we have two greater evil candidates, what exactly is the harm in standing up for your values? A democracy doesn't direct itself. You know, it needs direction from somewhere. It's not going to get direction from the parties of war and Wall Street. If we don't speak up and articulate our values and our priorities, and if we don't fight for them, it's hopeless. Think of the words of Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. We have to define that demand or call it a moral compass or call it whatever you want. But democracy needs that. It doesn't exist in a in a vacuum of values. We have to bring our values to this. So all of that is served by standing up and running. And if we get to 5% this time, you know, then we have a whole lot of funding uh, in the next presidential race, I think it's around $20 million, something like that. It might be more than that now. You know, that's nothing compared to the billion dollar races that the uh, major parties run. But, you know, we don't have the corruption that comes with that. It's going to cost us about a million dollars to get on the ballot, maybe two. It's going to cost RFK somewhere between 18 and 20 million because we're a grassroots campaign. We do things differently. So $20 million means a lot to us. Um, you know, so I just... Uh, I've become very intolerant of not to say that we shouldn't talk about it, but like I'm so um, not impressed, you know, when people don't get this and they're stuck in their little boxes. I feel so sorry for those people that their brains have just kind of shut down. Oh, and there's one other argument that I really suggest. It's not even an argument. It's facts. Uh, it's really important to point out to people what was the most spoiled election ever for Democrats? It was the 2010 midterms. What happened? They lost 1,000 legislative right. seats across the country, 64 congressional seats, 12 Senate seats, and 13 governorships. Where was the third party that they blamed this on, the spoiled elections? No third party there. Yep. This was the Democrats basically spoiling it for themselves by throwing working people under the bus. They've been doing that for a long time, but they really did it, you know, in 2008 when you had a Democratic trifecta in the White House and both houses of Congress, and they were very busy bailing out Wall Street. You know, when the public didn't want them to do that, that's what they did, and they threw out millions of homeowners. And that on top of, you know, Clinton and NAFTA and the loss of millions of jobs, right. people were really pissed. And that's how our voting system works, if we allow it to. It's about who do you hate the most? And actually... 
uh, it was Hillary Clinton, you know, who won that, who we hate the most in, in 2016. So people were voting for Trump, not because they were for right. Trump, but Absolutely. because they were really pissed at Democrats. So right. to my mind, these are all just like no brainer, right. overwhelming reasons why we need to, you know, we are the ones we've been waiting for. We need to be that democracy. Otherwise it doesn't exist. If you don't want a democracy, good luck to you. And, you know, just, uh, you know, hold on to your hat because you're in for a whole lot of trouble. We're not going to get out of this mess unless we fight our way out. And we've got to be part of that fight. Silencing yourself doesn't get us anywhere. And that's, that's well, yeah. 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 And this this party that is allegedly running on preserving democracy, stopping fascism. I mean, speak to the ballot, eff the efforts they've they've made over the years to keep greens off the ballots, just for an example. Which will is that saving democracy be a lot of your uh, funding, I would assume, is having to take on DNC lawyers who are going to challenge every signature. Is that what happens in every state? Uh, we are expecting that, you know, and that's what they just came out the other day in The New right. York Times. And then there was something before that. I don't know, might have been Politico or Yahoo News. I'm not sure. But right. there have been several like leaks, you know, purposeful leaks. And it's hard to believe how clueless can they be? They know how to fight. They just want to fight you. <laughs> they don't want to fight their, the people they're supposed to be opposing. They want to like clear out the left to pave the way for total fascism, right? And to think that they're actually saying the quiet part out loud here, because yeah. this is this is really like embarrassing and <laughs> and it's incriminating to say that this is what they're doing by intent. It's just like jaw dropping, and it reminds you kind of that it's we've got real idiots here you know uh, running the show and in the driver's seat and we can do this one other thing i wanted to point out was that we're going to have four pro genocide candidates between trump biden uh rfk and no labels you know a fake uh astroturf non-party <laughs> These are going to be four well-funded pro-genocide campaigns. They're all going to be splitting the pro-war vote. It's hard to say how that split's going to go, but it will have four competitors. On the other hand, there's only going to be one campaign to look at how it's going. There will be one pro-worker, anti-war, anti-genocide, climate emergency campaign that's on the ballot, broadly challenging empire and contesting across the country. There is exactly one of us that has a track record and that is on track right now to do this. So we may have one unifying campaign for the left at the end of the day. There are wonderful voices out there uh, in addition to our campaign, but they don't have a track record or really the wherewithal to get on the ballot broadly. So we right. are by all indicators, we're it, you know, we're the one option for fighting empire and oligarchy. This could be a very unifying fight. Empire and oligarchy may have four candidates that could be splitting their vote. When you have a five-way split, when you have five competitors, the race could be won with far less than a majority, far less than 30%. Technically, it could be won with as little as 21%. That's not to say that's how the vote is going to go, but that is to just remind us that we have every reason to stand up here and fight, not only like our lives depend on it, because they do, and the future depends on it, and having like a climate we can survive in and an economy we can survive in and all the rest, that depends on this fight. Um, but also it's never been more possible than it is right now. This is really the perfect storm in all kinds of ways. So don't listen to, you know, the predators and the pundits and, and the politicians who are basically just, uh, you know, telling you to take marching orders from them. There's every reason to think that we are um, major actors here in taking charge of our future. We have every reason to do that. Yeah, I mean, this this is the year it feels has the biggest opening for you and your voice and your platform, because as you said, I mean, OK, so first of all, I see no difference really between Biden and Trump, except that Biden enjoys no pushback from mainstream media, you know, right away. The death ticker for COVID disappeared and people, I think you know, the one thing that I think Democrats have done really well is imbue their voters with a sense of moral rectitude for voting for that party. So even when Biden does the exact same thing or worse than Trump, 
I will hear from liberals all the time, well, but he really means well, but he's a good person. He tries, you know, when Biden does it, it's different from when Trump builds the wall and bypasses 26, you know, environmental uh, laws. Um, and so that to me is the hardest thing though, because the media is really intent, corporate media on sustaining this duopoly and pretending that there's a big difference between red and blue. And and that, you know, and I'm sorry to keep coming back to liberals, but I do feel like they are the biggest impediment to progress because they have been so propagandized. They think that they're knowledgeable because they read the New York Times or watch MSNBC. And, you know, they, so are, do, do, does anybody invite you on or interview you from those places without the snide comments? Like, do you ever feel like you're getting a fair shot when you speak to any of the uh, legacy journalists? Journalists, Very few, you know, there are a couple. Right. Um, and I have to say when I've done uh, print media interviews because TV has been pretty shut down to yes. us. Uh, News Nation did a couple of interviews, but they are very, uh, pro Zionist, so they've kind of shut us out right. once that got going. Um, so there are there are very few, um, you know, like TV, uh, cable, right? Some of the alternatives will uh, interview us, and and we've had some, you know, really good uh, interviews, and and we have reason to think there are some coming up. Um, and the, I've had some great interviews with uh, print media journalists. Um, really uh, in many, many places, never the New York Times. They're like uniformly um, brain Got to get their wars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, like Politico, um, there's several others that aren't like top of mind at the moment. Yeah. But this race is really different because in the past, they would like really be out to just smear us from the get-go and it was right. really obvious this time i feel like i'm talking to a different generation of of reporters who yeah. know what it means now to be on the receiving right. end of uh empire and oligarchy so suddenly and i feel you like you you must lot. have even within these organizations that are normally against you 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 have allies who support the red line against genocide and i think that that's yeah. an in on on some level with groups that would normally push you out uh, yes. And what we're seeing especially now is um, people who are coming over and, and joining the campaign, just activists, you yeah. know, people who've been Democrats for their whole life and have been active Democrats. Uh, they're falling like flies right now. And that's really exciting to see. We have not been beating down the doors of organizations, you know, well, nonprofits, they they're they are pretty timid anyhow in, yeah. in races. Um, you know, I have to say the Muslim community has been just amazing. Absolutely. And we've been very active. Every time we visit a new city, usually we're connecting with, with the mosque. And they are very, you know, it's really wonderful to see them discovering their, uh, their power of democracy and them breaking away from their abusive relationship. Yeah. And it was interesting to see their their abandoned Biden uh, movement co-opted by Democrats to become uncommitted, <laughs> which was, you know, and there are still so many who, when they are interviewed, maintain abandoned Biden in spite of the Democratic leadership who sort of tried to co-opt it and rename it. Yeah, in, that's in, so in the primaries only. Yeah, exactly. In the primaries, we'll still come back. And yeah, exactly. And and that's kind of like a big question, and it's a big debate. I think right now in the Muslim community, how are they going to deal with this? And right. and I think, you know, it has slowed some things down, but some are really ready to go. You know, it's it's very interesting to see how a kind of political liberation mm -hmm. uh, spreads and. Right you know, courage is contagious and people really get, you know, the, the elected leadership, you know, they're not opening up like the right. mayor of Dearborn and stuff. We were right. there and, and they did not want to meet with us. Um, you know, maybe that will change, but right. that's the way it is for now. That's, a, that's, 
disappointing, actually. I, I, th I thought you were going somewhere else with that sentence. I got excited and then I realized what you said. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. they're definitely not ready, but others yeah. in the community definitely are. Right. And, you know, it's anybody's guess now, you know, how this is going to roll out. Is it because yeah. it really it's, is a politics of fear, right? And so until the elected officials, until the corporations are fearful, which, you know, the story is that that's sort of what pushed helped FDR get his capitalist posse in line was that they're going to come for you for pitchforks with pitchforks, which mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, we talk about this all the time. And I know, obviously you do uh, all these cop cities, the crackdown on protests, they are scared. But right now they have the weaponry <laughs> to keep people in line and to discipline a people in a, a, to a certain level. Where is that going to lead us? What do you think is going to happen there? Well, I think that is, um, you know, very scary. Um, I think this is part of what's in play right now. You know, I, I think uh, empire is in play and the heavy hand of political repression here at home, which is, you know, joined at the hip with empire. All of this is in play. I think that's what Gaza really is. Gaza is the tip of the iceberg of militarism. Israel was described by Caspar Weinberger, you know, the defense mm -hmm. for uh, Reagan. Israel is the unsinkable battleship for America uh, in the Middle East. What does that mean? You know, this is how we control the oil supply is what that means. And this is America's foreign policy, also known as full spectrum dominance. After the fall of the Soviet Union, this was the explicit name given to U.S. policy that we will dominate all areas of the world, all spheres of competition, and no powers will be allowed to rise even on a regional basis. This is kind of the mindset of the U.S. empire. This is why we fight war after war that we lose in a catastrophic way. According to Brown University Cost of War Project, you know, we have killed about 4 million people, some estimated at 6 million, in the wake of 9-11, of these wars. We also have... Um, so-called anti-terror operations in 85 countries around the world now. You know, this is just like jaw-dropping what's going on, much of it absolutely undercover. So this is not a world that we can survive in. This is not a world that can yeah. survive. This is a world that's heading for conflict, you know. And, you know, here our government and Joe Biden are looking for it. You know, will we get it in China? Yeah. Uh, how far can we push the envelope in Ukraine? And then you have the Middle East. So we really have three flagrant conflicts that could all go nuclear and all, you know, kind of take us down. This is not a, a world we can live in. And it's also impoverishing us here at home, consuming more than half of our congressional budget. And, you know, to your point about the uh, repression and militarization of police and all that, you know, this latest budget, I don't know if you follow Steven I, I do. I have so many of his graphics we're putting up later. Yeah. Yeah. And and his analysis of this budget, you know, this 2024 fiscal year budget, I forget what the number is, but it's like it's 1.1 trillion being spent on military and security and the security state here at home. Yep. And he, he gave an, a percentage to it. It's somewhere around 62 or 64%. It's not 50%. You know, it's not kind of the conventional wisdom that it's half. It's getting to be two thirds of our budget. So this doesn't work, you know, while right. tens of millions do not have homes, you know, right. are on the verge. Homelessness and evictions are at an all time yep. high. You have schools and libraries and like, right. Yeah, people are tearing their hair out. Right. Um, and the Democrats are now oh. running tough on crime. You know, that's they they just embraced the right wing rhetoric completely. Unbelievable. And they set up a system for the fascist. Like if they're so worried about the fascists taking over, the plan is we're going to provide them with militarized cops. Yeah. And then what? We just have to win for Democrats just have to win forever. Like so once you put that all in place. Yes. Uh, it's yeah, that that is really horrifying. And and it's horrifying the way it's all being mechanized and you know robot dogs and oh my god and and which also feels like what Israel is right a test ground for all of the military weapons exactly but you know the counterweight to this is that in spite of all of this we are you know gaining real traction around Gaza you know and yeah. fighting the empire head on and it's like people are geniuses you know and they figure out ways. Yeah 
to, um, you know, to like avoid the, uh, you know, the heavy hammer. And people are disrupting Biden's appearances all over the place. Yeah. It's made it impossible for him to campaign. He couldn't even get to the um, State uh, of the Union on time, <laughs> right? Miracle what's happening. Canceling you know, college campuses. I mean, come on, for a Democratic candidate, that's insanity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's think incredible. It's so it's really important to recognize, you know, and another quote here from Alice Walker, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. Yeah. We have it. We're using it. We're seeing it work. Why did the U.S. abstain from, you know, right. blocking the Security Council vote? Right. It's because we are, you know, we are making it impossible for them yeah. to conduct their genocide. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, if we are so lucky as to turn the White House into a greenhouse, you know, that the job of the president in our administration will be organizer in chief and it will be helping to coordinate our participation, our ownership right. uh, in democracy and instructing our elected officials what it is that they have to do, shaming them into town hall meetings, congressional hearings and right. all the rest so that the truth can have out. And so that people can exert their uh, small D democratic power over their elected officials. So while on one hand, fascism and scary, you know, uh, robotics and AI are merging with militarism and it's horribly Orwellian and super mm -hmm. scary. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we still have enormous power and we have ingenuity about where and how to use it. And people are doing that and we're going to keep doing that. And so, I think, you know, oh, sorry. I, Go ahead. I Pat. just wanted to say, I think the genocide really lays bare how little impact voting does and how little, not voting per se, but how little putting your faith in Democrats to do something mm -hmm. that the people support, you know, because they, like that Harvard poll, ages ago shows Princeton. that a Princeton, uh, how much the public supports an issue has no bearing on whether politicians yeah. support it at all. And yeah. it's just so openly obvious to a lot of people that didn't see this before. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it really is. And it's, and it's hitting home in so many ways. Were you going to say something? Layla? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank, thank you, Dr. Stein. I, I like to cut her off. Okay. Right. I do yeah, misogyny this, every show. Every the show. second half of our show, we, uh, you know, we spin a wheel. We talk about the topics of the week, and we drink too much, and we're we poke fun at each other. We're trying to be a little more professional in front of you right now. Um, you know, I think also one of the things that you just said that was exciting for many of us who um, were awakened by Bernie in 2016 and 2020 was the power of the people and the 99% versus the one. And then you know, we saw 2018 and AOC and bring the ruckus. And I was giving, you know, not a lot, but, you know, small amounts of money to 20 different candidates every month. And I was so enthusiastic. And then when Bernie shut it down and when I saw that even though some of the squad doesn't take corporate money, but they always fall in line to vote with the people who do and the inside outside strategy and not talking to left media and not trying to activate the base, not using COVID as a way to energize the country, an overwhelming majority of whom wants Medicare for all, like what, why wouldn't we, you know, that just dropped and everybody in office fell in line. And you have been outside of that mainstream political, you know, uh, one big party atmosphere, which again brings hope because I think so many people see when someone's running as a Democrat, even though they might say, you know, no, I'm on the outside, it just doesn't ever work out that way. So, we have no examples yeah. of them actually staying on yeah. the outside. It's just never happened. So that is thrilling to hear. And also, you know, I, I want to take a moment also to thank you again for coming on our, our small show. That's amazing. And we're so grateful, but it does show that you want to keep that connection with, with your base. And it's our only hope, you know, because uh, if we are so fortunate as to get into the White House. And in my view, that's not the only way to win this. There are many ways to win. Right. There are, you win simply by engaging the fight and by building the movement, you win. But if we were to get into the White House, 
it would be hopeless for us if we didn't, you know, because we're, we're not, we don't have other sponsors, you know, we right. don't have corporate sponsors, uh, big pharma, you know, uh, health insurance, fossil fuels. They don't sponsor us, you know, our APAC. Only, APAC yeah. Right. <laughs> they, uh, you know, uh, right. Yeah. Weapons profiteers, you know, yeah. that's not our thing. And yeah. uh, we would be high and dry and yeah. why, you know, I'm not, like at that point in my life and my career where I need to be a like politician. The yeah. People in the halls with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm doing this really for my kids, you know, for all yeah. kids because yeah. otherwise they're screwed. And yeah. as a parent, you know, it's just really hard to see the world going down the tubes and not, you know, I so relate to the parents in Gaza, you know, whose kids are starving, you know? Yeah. It's, it's just yeah. Un unthinkable. So yeah. At any rate, to your point, this is about, our fight, you know, and yeah. as far as I'm concerned, this is the fight of our lives. You know, yeah. I was a, um, you know, I was a clinician, I, I was a medical doctor, and then I got involved in more and more like community work. And I got very involved in studying um, toxic threats to like help clarify what is dangerous to us, kind of this right. emerging, just kind of peeking up above the horizon, this knowledge about, you know, what what's dioxin and pesticides and all these things with weird names and, you know, and you don't see it actually, you have to kind of study the language for years in order to read this stuff. But I was really pissed off when I, as a nursing mother, I heard that, oh, there's this stuff called dioxin in your breast milk and it's not, it's not good for anybody, you know? So I, I just really like dove into studying this stuff and, you know, worked with some really wonderful groups to fight it. And when we succeeded in taking uh, the pesticide called chlorpyrifos off the shelves for uh, consumers, not for uh, farm workers, although that followed eventually. But we got it off out of households, basically, right. which was huge. And I was celebrating at first. And then I thought, OK, one down, 450 <laughs> to go. <laughs> right. Work. We got rid of one. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like it, I began to feel like, OK, I'm just like documenting the demise of our species is yeah. what I'm doing here. And I like, I had to stop. I couldn't do that anymore because yeah. it was just so clear that there's a deeper driver. I've got very involved in getting money out of politics in Massachusetts. We passed a clean elections law, which created, you know, public funding for candidates who could show that they were viable. They had a base of support and so on. And it was a really great system. And the legislature, of course, wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. But we, the people, passed it by a two to one margin in a referendum, you know, by over 60 percent. It had huge support. And then what happened? Our progressive Democratic legislature repealed it on a voice vote. And to me, it was like that was the last straw. I was like, OK. Yeah. I'm not fighting on the issues anymore. I'm fighting the system because yeah. it's going to destroy everything that we do. And it was at that point, basically, that I got recruited. Tricked. Right. I got tricked. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't know any better. I said, well, everything else has failed. You yeah. know, might as well descend to that, you know, dark, you know. Yeah. That's how Lila got me on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it is really overwhelming. And it was the first thing that kind of got me uh, a little more radicalized in like 2010 is the environment and I have two kids and just thinking about my God, what is the future going to be? And then, and then we go from that to COVID to more war and, more, you know, it's, yep. it is so overwhelming. And you realize that, yeah, I mean, just chipping away at one item at a time is never, will be dead long before, you yeah. know, and the crazy thing is to see, and I, unfortunately, I think we're going to take over, but you know, Europe, you look at their uh, shredded wheat, it doesn't have yellow dye in it, even their fruit loops, or, you know, like oh, wow. uh, when England was having mad cow issues, mm -hmm. I think about three years ago, they refused to take any of our farm animal mm -hmm. that we were offering because we have different standards, much lower, you know, so I'm pleased that it still exists in other countries. And yet I feel like as I watch their national health care systems, you know, be obliterated, unless it has to be also international, right? This fight. Uh, yes. I mean, I think it has to be local. It has right. to be. State. Yeah, yeah. It has to be everything. And, you know, uh, I think the more we collaborate, you know, I think the U.S. is 
a big player here and we tend to corrupt things a lot. And if we could, you know, uh, grab hold of our go government, you know, I mean, to me, part of the critical reforms are closing the revolving door between our regulatory agencies and, um, you know, pharma and, uh, you know, the chemical companies and fossil fuels, you know, they're all regulating themselves, Boeing, right. uh, uh, the Sackler family, you know, yeah. and, and the politicians, and the GMO, they don't even care if they lose you know, anymore. Monsanto. Yeah. 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 Right. So that revolving door has to be, and, and this too, you know, to my mind, this undermines our public health crisis as well, because people no longer have confidence in our regulatory institutions. So they will just dig in their heels. You know, there is no trust and you can't get it by demanding it. You have to clean up the system, right. which means big money out of politics. Yeah. It means public funding of campaigns. It means closing the revolving door. Yeah. And, you know, the sooner we do that, the better. But if and when we do that, you know, I'm really quite convinced that it's a whole new ball game when you do that and when you can restore people's faith yeah. in our institutions again. We're not there. It's no. going to take a lot of work to get there. You know, this is my first presidential campaign where I know so many different people mm -hmm. running outside of the duopoly, right? So on some level, that's incredibly encouraging. There's you, there's Cornell West. I think a lot of us were hoping that that would be a ticket at one point. Um, I'm not sure uh, why that happened. And, you know, I think a lot of us are frustrated and sad that it what it feels like with PSL, Socialist Equality Party, there are so many different people running. And I, I would never uh, do the, you know, Hillary Clinton DNC thing of like, we have to unify and, you know, anybody, any vote that's not for my person is splitting the vote. And yet on some level, I wish that everybody could come together. What's your feeling? Is it, um, I guess, is it more like that who has ballot access? Do you feel like at a certain point, some of you who actually have very similar platforms might join forces? Is that too far down the road? I don't know. Uh, it's definitely a possibility, and and that's been a conversation ever since we entered the race. And the reason I was compelled to enter the race was because suddenly we had a vacancy, and we have all these ballot lines. And you know, right now we have something like twenty one, but there are several more states that we're about to turn in signatures for. We hope to be at twenty five or so very soon. And basically, seventy five percent of the signatures are already gathered. So we have seventy five percent of the work done. It's not seventy five percent of the lines, but it's seventy five percent of the work. So we have the big, difficult states done, California, Texas, uh, Florida. How many, how many and, states are you flat out just excluded from? Like nothing you could do would get you on the ballot. Uh, we hope none. There are okay. three we have three very difficult battles. It will cost us if we can raise one and a half million dollars, it's a done deal. And, you know, viewers, and, anyone with a hundred, <laughs> even a thousand will do, you know, a thousand is really all we can take. Well, we can actually, you can max out at 3,300. 3, we'll find but, a way. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, go to our website yeah. um, because this is, we can do it with, with one and a half million dollars RFK. You know, he's saying it'll, he could do it with 18 or 20 million, um, you know, and for all of his, Big talk. He's only on in I think three or four states right now. Oh, you know, but we're we're on in a lot, and we had all many of these lines already. And this is you know to the credit of the state parties because we are a decentralized grassroots network. You know, for better and for worse. Right. Um, but we do have a lot of grassroots power. A lot of people who know how to do this. They've been watchdogging, and you have to use it or lose it. So suddenly, when uh, Dr. West decided he wanted to run solo, and we can talk about that. Um, yeah. you know, but basically he's a strong solo voice. He always has been, he doesn't right. have, he never had any like relationship with a political party. It right. is very hard to learn that on the fly as someone yeah. who jumped in to a governor level race, not knowing the green party. I just jumped in. I couldn't work with the party at all. I mean, we wound up kind of doing our own thing, which you could do at the governor's level level, but you definitely can't do it at the national level. You need the support of all the parties all over it. So it's right. really hard to do this without support of a party. But, you know, if like you're a Democrat, there's a machine and you just plug into the machine right. and they sweep you up and they give you a database and they give you staff and, you know, and they raise money for you and it's all done for you. It's not like that in, in right. grassroots parties. You really have to kind of 
learn the ropes. You have to learn who to work with in the party, right. uh, where the party uh, moves you forward, where they kind of hold you back. You have to learn how to negotiate all this stuff with an organization. It's very difficult to do. So when Dr. West agreed that he would run as a green, you know, uh, I certainly knew that this was not nef- necessarily going to be a done deal, that this is a leap of faith and you're going to see how it works. And I think it was just way too frustrating for him to right. have to work with all these people who were like wanted to tell him what to do. And he definitely did not want to hear what right. to do. He wanted to do it his own way, which he is continuing to do. And that's his right. Right. But, you know, if you have a lot of people who are going to work for you for free, and we did, we mm-hmm. jumped in and we were 24 seven giving up family vacations over the summer, you know, right. just, it was a total scramble to try to uh, make that campaign work. We poured our heart and soul into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the day, he wanted to be an unencumbered solo voice. Cause if you've got people working for you, they want to know what your policies are. You're going to have to debate it. Uh, it was an issue for him that he was going to be expected to participate in any number of forums and debates. He really didn't yeah. like the idea. But the main thing was that we had differences in how we were going to run a campaign. I jumped in as a interim campaign manager and I'm used to working in a way that, um, what should we say, gets results. You know, I mean, I've seen a gazillion campaigns fall apart and I know what the warning signs are and you really need people who have experience. You have to work with people who are experienced. You can't, you know, you can't like make it a family based campaign or a friends based campaign. And I can see where people want to do that when you have to have a lot of trust, right? It's hard to trust strangers. So I, I totally get where these different impulses are coming from, but I wasn't there to be a yes man. And I think that was not appreciated. And, you know, so I just backed off and, you know, and so I, I stepped back from being a campaign manager and really from having any formal role. And then the next thing I heard, and this was maybe two months later, maybe more than that, uh, Dr. West had decided, you know, I was called to, I got, I got a phone call and I was told that they were going to leave the, um, the green party. Did I want to come with? And I said, well, thanks very much. But, um, you know, but yeah. I'm here to build a party. We've been building this party for years. Right. We have ballot lines. We got to use those ballot lines. So yeah. you should know if you leave the party um, that there's a very good chance that I'm going to be pressured into jumping in because there aren't many people in this in this 11th hour who could jump in and get a campaign going. But I've had you know, like people that I work with and know the ropes here right. have been fighting the Federal Election Commission nonstop for the last six years. Yeah. So I, I know how to do this. And it's a very there's a very high probability that I'm going to be running against you. And, you know, I'm sorry about that. But, you know, I'm here to build this movement. And so they knew what was coming Um, but they said, no, it's a done deal. It hasn't been announced. It's a done deal. From my point of view, the issues could have been worked out, right? uh, but there was no interest in doing that. So I think that really hurt, um, Dr. West's feelings that I jumped in and ran, but you know, that's kind of like, I've spent my life building a political organization. Yeah, absolutely. Gonna just throw that away because somebody has a strong solo voice. I, for me, it's yeah. not the candidate. It's really about the movement. Absolutely. Okay. So on that note, uh, are you going to choose a VP to run with you soon? Or is that, how does that work with the Green Party? Is it voted on amongst all the different states? Or how do you how do so, you progress from here? Yeah. You know, you may remember in 2016, I had appealed to Bernie to uh, consider actually taking my place, you know, which would have been difficult to do, but maybe not impossible. That would have, Um, I think, changed everything, actually. It would have hugely, but he wouldn't even talk to me. I mean, so there was like no communication between our campaigns whatsoever. Um, This time, you know, I put out immediately that I would be interested in building a collaboration with Dr. West or potentially with one of the other candidates. And Dr. West, I think, kind of clarified that he wasn't really interested in that. Uh, he wanted to kind of go his own way, um, you know, which he's continued to do. And that's totally fine. But I know that there are other uh, candidates who are probably interested. They're also, you know, just really wonderful, um, you know, voices out there 
in the Muslim community, in the indigenous community, yeah. in the African American community. So there are wonderful unifying campaigns that could be brought to bear. And all this is under discussion right now. Right. But there is, I think, uh, enormous momentum out there to build collaboration across the left. This is not yeah. time to be played into the divide and conquer game, which right. is you know, where the predator state would like us to be. Yeah. And uh, truth to tell, uh, many of us as Greens and socialists have been working on building collaboration for a long time. Starting in 2012, we had an organization called Left Elect, which brought together many socialist parties, right. um, basically all the non-corporate parties. Right. Um, working families may have even been a part of that, um, although that's a little bit debatable about their role in this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, many of them are very good hearted. And yeah. Well, um, but just don't understand how that right. you know, uh, fusion voting is used, uh, basically, right. to, to you know, yeah. to, as a as a stomping. It's a, it's a Trojan horse, basically. It's a Trojan horse. For God, they have so many of them out there, don't they? The, oh, the Democratic they're, Party, they just they're thrive on it. Horses all over the place. But we were starting back in 2012 to build solidarity and collaboration with Socialist Alternative and. Um, uh, many um, right. of the socialist and greens largely. And um, that was going pretty well and building slowly until 2016 when Bernie jumped in. And when Bernie jumped in, that was just like the end of it and everybody ran to Bernie. And I think people have kind of like finally recovered from that, but yeah. everybody's lives are so devastated now, just trying to pay your rent and, you know, be an activist and, and everything. So it's been harder to build that, but this campaign, you know, this election, I think, is the opportunity to do that. So yeah. I'd say stay tuned. Well, Will you have, oh, sorry, go ahead, Pat. Sorry. Well, I, I just think a lot of these other parties, you know, with, when realism sets in that they're not going to get ballot access, I don't see West voters not voting for you largely in the end of the day. So. And that's kind of our feeling, too, that this isn't a debate we have to have. Right. I mean, we don't need, I think it's good for us to all be in forums, you know, but we pretty much agree with each other. Yeah. And, you know, the difference is that we have a track record for getting on the ballot. We know how to do it. It's damn hard. But we do have most of that work behind us. Um, we have more to go. We got three, basically three really tough states ahead of us. New York, they're really trying to screw us. They, you know, uh, uh, talk about Trojan horses. This was like a poison pill in a budget bill many years ago. They did not like that Howie Hawkins had gotten 5%, I think, which, and had really given um, uh, a lot of support to an anti-fracking agenda. And Cuomo had had to deal with that. Wasn't happy, really wanted to be sure that, um, uh, that the Greens, you know, were not a factor. And he introduced, unbeknownst to most people, this change in ballot requirement that increased the number of signatures from somewhere around 30,000, I think, up to 45,000. And when that number of signatures is required, you have to get almost twice as many to be sure that you have that number of valid signatures. So this means collecting at least 80,000, 75, 80,000 signatures, and they shorten the time frame to put it into six weeks. So this is like huge. It's an all hands on deck thing. Um, it's a great way, you know, to talk to people, to educate voters, uh, to exercise, you know, yeah. democracy, grassroots democracy at its most basic level. I really encourage anybody who wants to come to New York for a week and, and be a part of this or a weekend or whatever. Or if you live in New York or nearby, you know, so what's, what's the deadline? For this in New York. Um, so it begins uh, in the middle of April. I forget which date exactly. And then it's six weeks after that. So it would be the end of April to mid-May to the end of May. Well, please the, recruit uh, us we, or at least give us a message and we'll we'll do okay. our best to Absolutely. get it out. We just, we just got uh, from Georgia. Big news. Jill passed the goal for matching funds today. We can now file for matching federal funds and your donations will be doubled up to $250. That is fantastic. Thank you for... Uh, Letting us know. Congratulations. That's very and, cool. Uh, yeah. And that's exactly how we will, you know, get our insurance policy because 
uh, raising money then enables us to both coordinate volunteers and right. to uh, bring on some professional collectors who help take some of the edge off of this. So if people are in a position to be able to contribute, you know, this is amazing. And this is how Bernie really built, built his movement from, right. you know, lots and lots of small contributors who were saying, you know, God damn it, you know, yes. <laughs> democracy, you know, so and in, that, in, sorry. You be, uh, in this case, you won't be jerked around, you know? Yeah. Yes. I mean, and you, I'm trying to rifle through some of the comments. There's so many and everybody wants to say hi. And I'm sorry, because it covers your face when I put it up there, but there's so many oh, great yeah, comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I think Bernie did do really well was these rallies with people who it, it like he had a whole team of people who could who it was that sort of not not me us and when he was sick other people could go and give the same speech and you know are you going to be able to start doing rallies or try yeah, okay i mean obviously it takes a lot of money but um do you have any itinerary already or well you let us know? no um we got our first offers actually um for people on the ground who have the capacity to um basically bring lots of people together. And this right. is actually coming from the Muslim community oh. and it's in California. But uh, we're, we're in California. Are you? Okay. Well, I know there's going to be a Northern and a Southern. So there were right. two of them. So stay tuned, you know, to our, our- I'm Los Angeles and Pat's in Sacramento. Oh. So yes. We that's will. really great. Okay. Huh. All right. Terrific. So see you at both of these rallies. And yeah. absolutely. The other thing that I thought, and I know I got a lot of pushback on this, but, um, Bernie did have some big, you know, big musicians, big actors, famous people. And I think especially because there is this element of fear amongst voters and it needs to be sanctioned by somebody yes. else before they can jump in. Are, are you making attempts to try to get sort of some big endorsements? I mean, I don't know, name endorsements kind of deal, like famous people, an actress, a singer, whatever. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And right now, uh, you know, we are kind of in conversation with some people on right. social media, and we're hopeful that there will be endorsements. Um, you know, successful people are not the first ones to come out, yeah. you know, because they got a lot to lose. And yeah. yep. last time around, you know, some of our endorsers were really kind of frightened. The whole Russiagate thing came out. Yeah. And they really worried about, you know, kind of getting screwed and all that, you know, so I, Susan Sarandon is someone yeah. that I'm really hoping is going to come around. But some of these people made preliminary promises to like support um, Marianne mm -hmm. Williamson, who's still hanging in there. Now you could say, where is she going to go with this exactly? I mean, there's not really a future. I'm hoping people will start to be more strategic and realize we have a chance, you know, yeah. we have a chance to completely upset the apple cart here to really turn politics on its head. This is the perfect storm right it now really is. for really concerted organizing. So we're really hoping that strategic people will start thinking about this strategically and, and get on board sooner rather than later, because there are any number of, you know, influencers and yeah. it could really help stir the pot well, here. Like you said, you are the only anti-genocide candidate that's yeah. going to have ballot access. So exactly. to me, that's a winning platform right there. I mean, yeah. honestly. And, you know, so I'm an actress here in Los Angeles and seeing the outcry, the people who were let go from their agencies. I mean, Susan Sarandon was one of them uh, just for saying ceasefire, not even for, you know, um, but that is starting to change. I mean, then, of course, we saw the backlash through the Oscars, but but even there, there were a few people wearing the pins. There was Mark Ruffalo and some other, you know, it feels like there is an opening as long as they really understand, because I think a lot of people don't understand that you truly are the only anti-genocide candidate as much as some people are trying to frame themselves slightly differently. If you, if you chip away, just like what, and by the way, and I'm sorry to ask, but I think you, I read you were raised Jewish. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So was I. So like, I'm, you know, I'm the capo and I'm, you know, the anti-Zionist Jew, but I do think that that is something that helps people who are scared of being labeled, uh, you know, an anti-Semite. Anti yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, there are so many, you know, like pitfalls that, that people can trip over. They're worried about, you know, 
being perceived as an anti-Zionist and, oh, that's anti-Semitic. Right. Um, Just go vote know. for Hamas. I got a bunch of those today. Go vote for well, Hamas. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's a lot of that, you yeah. know, you're going to do the Russiagate thing again. Yeah. But it's like, hey, I was investigated for three years and I was basically fully exonerated. So like, yeah, can come up with something new. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I sort of feel like we're all being tested right now. You know, yeah. it's like the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Right. But it doesn't bend by itself. It's yeah. No, it just, <laughs> yeah. Are we up to this? Yeah. This moment, you know, I we're living in the genocide. To are we going to normalize the torture and systematic murder of children? That's the question that's on the table right now. Are we going to allow international law to be dismantled at a time when the American empire is really failing? It is unraveling. We're not going to be top dog. I mean, we're no longer top dog. We're just pretending to be top dog. So we need international law here. Yeah. You know, uh, we need for a nuclear war not to be uh, triggered by what's going on in the Middle East right now. You know, we need for adults to be in the room. We need to um, uh, really uh, throw out these uh, criminal abusers who are in the role right now of defining our lives and the lives of this world. And they're gambling with nuclear weapons and nuclear war all the time, not to mention the climate. They're clueless. They are clueless and they are, you know, um, uh, just, vacuous and lacking moral direction and insight. They're brain dead, in my view. They're, they're just brain dead. And yeah. we need to remove them from power as quickly as possible. We need just kind of a new kind of reboot for the promise of democracy. We've never had it. It's always been flawed. Now it's like in way worse shape, I think, than it's ever been, arguably. And we have to stand up and make this better. It's not going to happen by its by itself, but this is the moment to do that. You know, we need to be strategic Amen. and 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 challenge power right now, as Frederick Douglass said. Power concedes nothing um, without a demand. It never has, and it never will. We got to be Between that. The, We're the not genocide, the cost of living, the housing costs, the <laughs> lack of health care, the no COVID protections. The, I mean, it just goes on and on and. There's so much to wake people up to now that if you get them on one issue, it might be enough to get them to see the whole big picture. Yeah. And that's yeah. the hope. Yeah, exactly. And all these things are so connected and we can help people connect the dots. You know, when you become a uh, news junkie, like so many of us are, you know, you pay a lot of attention when you're fortunate enough to be able to follow right. this stuff. Um, there's a lot that we can share you know, with yeah. a lot of people and people are so hungry right now for conversations where they can talk to people who don't smell like a rat. Most people involved in the political process really smell like a rat, especially if you're up close yeah. to them. And so, you know, actually having contact with people is very, um, you know, uh, uplifting and informative and very kind of community building right now. Right. And this is just like mm -hmm. basic human dialogue here that's happening and it's very exciting how this is this really has the potential to transform our world and it is transforming our world you know the fact that the u.s abstained um yep. in, you know in absolutely that security council that says we are actually you know we are winning the day here yeah. not to mention you know 68 percent of the vote going back to one of the earliest right. um you know, uh, polls. We're managing to make things not worse, but we're not making it better. You know what I mean? Like, we're not making substantial changes to people's health care. I mean, our voices are getting heard, but it's not enough. And anyone waiting for this system to save them is, it's fool's gold. It's not happening. We need something big and dramatic and a big change. And if you do look at some of the parameters, you know, um, it is getting worse, you know, like climate. Climate is going down the tubes, even when the Democrats are pretending, you know, with their false solutions and, you know, uh, Obama and his all of the above, which is basically what Biden's policy is. Yeah. Um, things are getting very much worse rather quickly. You know, the oceans are kind of dying. Uh, you know, we are in the sixth grade extinction. You know, you can go on and it's pretty alarming. Um, 
that, you know, that the people power is where it is. It is. And, you know, if you look at even like racial disparities, they're actually worse than they were in 1960, uh, in the 60s, that in yeah. fact, um, African Americans have a smaller slice of the pie, the average household, than it did before, you know. So thanks, Obama. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's true. That's, yeah. that's really true. And yeah. it's been a, a steady slide. So I think the, you know, it's really true that we can make this better. And yeah. Uh, we don't have to participate in the whitewash of, right. you know, the system as it exists. There's every reason for us to demand an America and a future that works for all of us. And, you know, to harness the power that Alice Walker talks about when she says that the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. We have it. We got to use it. If ever we had to, this is that moment of, you know, dire uh, necessity and really just unstoppable uh, possibility. This is that moment right now. And amen. This is, yeah. Um, Dr. Stein, I'm realizing we have kept you over an hour and I promised that we would allow you to like, let you off the hook after an hour. So um, that was actually a beautiful way to end. Is there anything else you want to say? Yep, yeah, there we go. Uh, before before you take off, is there any, you know, we'll definitely look out for your appearances, anybody who can help donate or gather signatures, but anything else you want to leave us with before you go? Uh, I think you covered the bases, just that it's been wonderful to, you know, to visit with you and connect with you. And I look forward to more of it. Thank as you. As forward And thank you for your, you know, your inspiration and your information. It's been really great to hang with you for an hour and I <laughs> thank yeah. you it, well you are welcome back anytime we might have to have you uh i don't know if you're a drinker or a weed partaker but you know the second half of the show is where we all let our hair down so when when you're under a little bit less stress in your life uh we'd love to have you come back and, and hang out but even before that we would love it thank you and, and, and i hope to see you in, in california at the absolutely you can count on it yeah yeah, Thank let's so do a much. live show or something. Oh, hey, my uh, God. Yeah. Amazing. I'm going to hold you to that now. I'm writing okay. it down. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Really wonderful. Wonderful Thank to be you. with you. Okay. Cheers. All best. Be Take well. Bye-bye.